Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, welcome to our regularly scheduled meeting of Monday, October 2nd, 2017. Tony. Here. Uh, Councilor uh, Rell. Here. Councilor Spinella. Here. Deputy Mayor may be late. And Mayor Montaneri. Here. Thank you, Dolores. <coughs> um, <coughs> sadly, uh, events in the uh, United States, Arizona last night require uh, a moment of silence this evening in advance of our regular scheduled meeting agenda uh, on behalf of those that. Uh, were harmed or lost their lives and their families and friends, first responders, uh, asked for a moment of silence. Thank you. We have, we're going to start the presentation? Yeah, we're going to okay. start the presentation. Okay, thank you. Yep, you have the floor. Good evening. Um, my name is Erica Texera. I'm the Assistant Director of uh, Social and Youth Services for the Town of Wethersfield. I'd like to acknowledge tonight, um, we have a few members from our Youth Advisory Board here in the audience. We have Barbara Rue, Eric Knapp, Pam Harrison, Ken Lesser, um, Kathy Bagley, and then um, our uh, town council liaison, Anthony Spinella, is here as well. Okay. The Youth Advisory Board chose to pursue a youth needs assessment in town during the fall of 2016. The needs assessment was funded by a grant from the Capital Area Substance Abuse Council, um, also known as CASAC. The Youth Advisory Board and Youth Service Bureau partnered with the school system to administer the survey to the middle school and high school students. Tonight we have Bonnie Smith, a consultant from ERACE, which stands for East of the River Action for Substance Abuse Elimination, here to present data from the survey. The Youth Advisory Board has started to develop a plan to disseminate data, and one of the first steps is providing information at a town council meeting. The group plans to use these results of the survey to guide our future pr um, prevention work in town and target areas of concern. So I'd like to thank you and then also welcome Bonnie Smith up to present the data. <coughs> Hi everyone, I'm Bonnie Smith and thank you. Yeah, that should be good. I might have to kind of scooch over to see where we are. but. Um, I'm Bonnie Smith. Yes, I'm a consultant from ERACE, and I work part-time for Yukon Health, measuring data to guide communities in planning substance abuse and mental health interventions, um, following evidence-based strategies. It's very exciting work. So I'm also a mom here in town in the High Crest District. I have a fifth grader, third grader, and kindergartner. So I'm really thrilled to be able to present these data to you tonight. I have a lot of data, and I'm going to move quickly. Um, there's more here than really you can comprehend it this time. Uh, let's see, let's go into presentation mode. Or not. <coughs> I'm going to keep talking because I can't, this is a PDF. So this survey was administered to all students last fall 2016 with an overall response rate between grades 7 through 12, not elementary students, of 87.5%, um, which is a really great representation of students. This survey was administered by passive consent, meaning parents were notified and they could opt their child out and could review a copy of a paper tool before survey administration. Uh, 
I'm um, going to talk about past month or 30 day use of core substances and behaviors. And we call them core because they're measured by the federal government. And when communities seek federal substance abuse prevention grants, they have to have data on many of these items in order to be competitive. So here you can see um, in the red is the high school, blue is middle school. And the most commonly used substance in the past 30 days um, was marijuana followed by alcohol then um, cigarettes and prescription drugs. You see bin binge drinking here as well, which is four or more drinks at one occasion, um, which is, of course, a subgroup of underage drinking along with the alcohol. Um, middle school students, the most commonly reported risky behavior was gambling, followed by prescription drugs. We measure uh, students' perception of risk because we want to know um, how harmful they perceive something to be. And you can see for the middle school, um, grades seven and eight, that cigarettes were perceived as most harmful, followed by prescription drugs, then gambling. We measure gambling because it's considered a behavior that is highly correlated with later substance use and has other risk factors as well for youth. And then for the high school, the substance of most perceived risk is cigarettes, just like middle school, followed by prescription drugs, but marijuana falls quite low with only 52% of students perceiving marijuana to be of moderate or great risk. Perceived parental disapproval of student substance use or gambling, you can see here for grades seven through eight, it's pretty consistent. And then at the high school, you see some changes, um, but all relatively high perceptions of parental disapproval across substances and behaviors. Uh, the highest perceived parental disapproval um, for high school is cigarettes and for middle school, prescription drugs. And this, for prescription drugs, we're talking about non-medical use or have you ever used a prescription medication for the purposes of getting high or to feel good. Perceived friend disapproval, how wrong would your friends feel if you did this? Um, looking at moderately and greatly wrong, middle school students, uh, cigarettes, marijuana, and prescription drugs come fairly close, <coughs> followed by, at the high school, um, prescription drug misuse is the perceived most disapproval amongst friends followed by cigarettes, with the lowest again following suit with marijuana. Accessibility of drugs is important when we look at policy and policy enforcement. So uh, students perceive alcohol to be the number one most easy to access substance in both middle school and high school. In the high school, marijuana comes second. And in the middle school, prescription drugs come second, whereas in the high school, prescription drugs come third. Um, the least easy to access are illegal drugs, that sort of generic category. We look at age of initiation because we like to understand what comes first. Um, it's not to say that the person who initiated gambling at age 12.5 is now the person who at 14 is using alcohol, but it's important to understand the trajectory of risky behaviors. So here you can see that on average, youth who report gambling do so um, on average at 12.5 years, and then move on to tobacco products a little higher than 13 and a half years old. Just over <coughs> 14 e-cigarettes come into play, um, followed by alcohol, then moving up to marijuana, just over 14 and a half, and prescription drugs is the same. So youth don't typically begin using substances like marijuana or prescription drugs. They <coughs> usually initiate with a risky behavior um, and other products. So tobacco, you might even look at the antiquated term um, is gateway, but truly there is some relevance to that. Um, having family rules is an important protective factor against youth substance use, but you can see here that consistently for tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs, and gambling, rules or perception of rules are fairly consistent, with gambling being the least so. And that's not uncommon. I see that in most communities because parents don't often think of gambling as a substance or, I'm sorry, a behavior of concern, at least not at this age. This is a graph that shows tobacco and e-cigarette use by grade. I'm not going to go into detail, but it does show certainly, like most substance use, 
At the high school level, it starts to increase be grade, between grades 9 and 10, and then 10 and 11, and then oftentimes 11th and 12th grade, you'll see either even or 11th grade being slightly higher than 12th grade. Uh, we do want to watch the use of e-cigarettes, and later in the presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, what you put in an e-cigarette these day, this day and age is um, a little confusing. So we do ask what students use. Mostly e-cigarettes at 49% of the time, or e-flavors, I should say. And then it's even between tobacco and nicotine products and marijuana or cannabis products, both at 23%. So e-cigarettes are not necessarily a tobacco or nicotine system. It can be a system to um, get high from marijuana products or alcohol at 15%. Sources of alcohol, um, consistently amongst the high school students that begins with friends, then other people at a party with an adult's permission, someone age 21 or older, then parents, oh, I'm sorry, parents or guardians without permission and parent parents or guardians with permission. Whereas middle school students uh, mostly obtain alcohol from their parents with permission at 21.4% of the time, as well as at a party and friends and without permission. It kind of blends. Very uncommon to see youth access alcohol from restaurants, stores, or bars. This um, table demonstrates where youth most often um, or sometimes drink, and by far that's at the homes of other people, followed by their own homes or at a party without an adult, 30 or older present. So this is certainly implications for our messaging to our families in the community. Um, binge drinking, again, is four or more drinks on a single occasion. Uh, it's certainly highly correlated with adverse outcomes for youth. Um, with unintentional injury and legal involvement. So you can see here that by 12th grade, 28.4% of students had binge drink in their lifetime. Um, and in the past 30 days or past month, 9.4% of 11th graders had binge drink. This is about driving under the influence. This is only asked of students who are in grades uh, 11 and 12 because they are the, those that are eligible <coughs> to drive. So driving under the influence, the rates are actually quite low. We certainly don't want to see any youth driving under the influence, but um, the average between grade 11 and 12 is 2.2 percent ever in their lifetime and under 1 percent for the past month. Riding in a vehicle when a driver is under the influence of alcohol. So uh, that could be a peer or an adult. We try to specify. Um, for grades 7 through 12, so all students in the sample, 23% had driven with uh, someone under the influence in their lifetime. And 17% had ridden with an adult in their lifetime. Um, the past month rates are relatively low, but still, you, you, you wouldn't want 5.8% of youth riding with a driver under the influence of alcohol in the past uh, month. You can see here again marijuana use. Uh, this demonstrates lifetime past month and frequent use. We have um, up to 8.8% of 12th graders reporting frequent use, which is defined as, I believe, 10 to 30 times in the past month, um, or frequent or daily use is how it's worded in the survey. But the marijuana use follows that same trend of, of increasing at the high school level and then stepping up a bit for the older grades. Uh, the most common influence reported here to try marijuana for the first time is curiosity for both middle and high school students. Middle school students report more influence from their family and then high school students are citing friends and peer pressure. Sources for high school students of marijuana um, most commonly are friends or parents without permission, whereas the middle school students report almost equally across categories with parents with permission, parents without permission, friends or brothers or sisters. I'm talking a lot. Does anybody have questions at this point? <laughs> let's, let's break it up a little. <laughs> Is that um, okay with, with? Yeah, we can break it up, right? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Do you have data from like 10 years ago or no, to this like is... compare to to say we're better or worse or? So this is Weathersfield's first data source for the community. However, we're going to move on to comparisons to the region and the state in a few minutes. So you have something to compare to and you have some good news coming. Well, you know, you have no past data to compare I don't to. have Weathersfield specific past data. But do you have other past data to compare to? Yes, okay. right. definitely. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I think I worked with you once before. I'm on the um, Health and Tobacco Trust Fund. Oh, yeah, community. yeah. Yep, and you were yep. very informative for us a couple years back. I think we did something in Middletown with you, quite possibly. So thank you for this. Thank you. Um, yeah. Just actually, you stopped right when I had a question with the friends for the, let's see, what am I on, influence? Yes, that one, uh, fam, nope, family for mm -hmm. marijuana. Sure. Now, is that broken down? Uh, it probably isn't, but would it be broken down by parents or siblings, do you know? For this one, it is not. When we look at sources, which I think was the previous, no, other way. Sources, we break it down between friends, brothers, sisters, and parents, but influence, it's just under family. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi. I was just curious, is parents, guardians with permission, does that, was there anything in there to indicate like for a health reason or is that straight up, hey, I want to smoke pot and mom and dad said it was okay? Well, what you're asking is certainly relevant with the times with the, the movement toward um, palliative use of marijuana, but the survey doesn't dictate for medical reasons, and in fact, there's nowhere in the survey where marijuana for medicinal purposes comes up. At this time in the state of Connecticut, it is not legal, to my knowledge, for anyone under the age of 18 to be prescribed medical marijuana. Um, certainly families would have access to it, and that may increase youth access, either intentionally or unintentionally. It's not legal for anybody. It's still a federal crime, even though we violate it all the time. <clears throat> Thank you, Anthony. I was going to mention yes. that, but thanks. <laughs> oh, well, for medicinal purposes, however. It's illegal. Okay. Federal government still has it either. <clears throat> all right. Any other questions? All right, I'll keep moving quickly. Thank you for the break from data. Um, here we're talking about prescription and over-the-counter medication use um, by grade. I like to focus in here on the darker blue, which is all prescription medications combined. Um, the breakdown into the type really doesn't impact the type of prevention messaging we might use with youth. So overall, these rates are consistent with what I see in other communities and relatively low. So by high school, 13.7% of 12th graders had used prescription drugs non-medically in the past month. Um, it brings up the subject of our opioid epidemic here in the state and the nation. And I think it's really important as we look at these data to understand the context for that. While opioid addiction, whether it's non-medical use of prescription drugs, heroin, fentanyl, et cetera, is extremely serious and impacting the individuals and families in our state and our nation, um, it's important to recognize that other substance use precurses that in most situations. So here we can see that opioids are not a significant or serious concern for this age group, but oftentimes between ages 18 to 25, that will increase. Student sources of prescription drugs are most common um, in the high school from friends, followed by parents without permission. And then in the middle school, you see it's relatively even between parents with permission and parents without permission. Um, again, we have a lot of media campaigns in our state reminding us to properly dispose or lock it up, and this is certainly data to support that. Other drugs we certainly worry about as a community, um, but what I'm seeing in this data set is that other drugs of concern, which certainly have serious effects, um, highest rate of lifetime use comes up as 1.5% for inhalants. Now, inhalants are serious. If you use them once, you could die. Um, but it's not something we often talk about. And then moving on to synthetic marijuana, another substance of concern 
very low percentage rate at 1.4 percent of youth using that in their lifetime again it could have pretty deadly or serious health repercussions upon even one use energy drinks we monitor um, because there have been some health effects uh, from overuse of an energy drink and 7.6 percent of youth had combined an energy drink with alcohol in their lifetime this is what I think we've all been waiting for. We want to see how Weathersfield compares to other communities who have used this survey in the past several years and the nation. So um, this data indicates that Weathersfield um, comes in quite low compared, in fact, to the state and the nation. And um, to the extent I asked the analyst at Erase to triple check these data because I did question them initially. Um, but upon continued review of the data, uh, Weathersfield does come in quite low. Um, as a prevention person, I wouldn't say, don't worry about it. We want to see no youth use and, and prevent and reduce as much as we can. And it certainly doesn't make Weathersfield <coughs> ineligible for certain federal grants. It just means um, we plead our cases, this is what we have and this is what we want to see happen. So um, the overall past month alcohol use rate for Weathersfield is 10.2% compared to 20% for the region and 32.8% uh, for the state. Uh, marijuana use follows a similar trend with being at 10.4% compared to 17.4% for the region and 21% for the nation. I'm not going to go into each one, but you can see here that. What's the region? So the region is the towns that have used the ERASE survey in the past two years. We aggregate the data, and then we weigh the data for comparison purposes. So I believe in this data set, there's five communities. But because the data are weighted, the demographics of this um, community will be balanced in the comparison measure. Are there cities in there? In the past two years, um, there are not cities in this data set. But again, that would be accounted for in the weighting of the data. Um, I believe the communities in this are Ellington, not Vernon, maybe Stafford. I've done a lot of data presentations in two years. I apologize. Ellington, Tolland is one. And then there's probably two others. But along those, I like to think about those of you who know district reference groups from the State Department of Ed. The majority of communities within this data set are falling in the B, C, and D reference groups for those who know them. This is not really my conclusion, but I'm gonna move quick. Again, the take home message is if you prevent alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, you're not going to have as likely a situation with opioid use amongst <coughs> youth especially. We did do some school climate measures. So this is bullying, lifetime in blue, past month in red. Uh, you can see that as students age, bullying goes down. So it, it's a great case for, um, it gets better for youth. Um, places that youth in the past 30 days or ways they've been uh, bullied, the majority have had other students spread lies or rumors, followed by being left out or excluded. Um, and then mean comments about my race follows within there. Not as much physical violence, pushing, shoving, etc. The places youth report being bullied at the high school level um, start with in the stairwells or hallways, in the lunchroom, or online and through text messaging, certainly something we all as parents are aware of, um, trying to monitor at least. We've been looking more recently at the perception that students that are high achieving are less likely to be substance users. And we're finding that that is not always the case in the data we've looked at. So there's a lot of pie charts here. I'm going to have you focus on, let's look at lifetime alcohol use. So that will be your top right. So you can see here that the, there's 34.7% of students who have used alcohol in their lifetime um, get mostly A's and B's. So 
I think it's just a great cautionary tale of don't assume that the high achiever is not using. There's a lot of pressure both socially and academically to achieve certain things and sometimes turning to substances are a way to cope with that. Um, and then you see that was the largest category. Um, actually, youth who are getting Bs are the least likely to report lifetime al alcohol use, whereas those who have Bs and Cs and below are again more likely. I'm not going to go into the detail of all of these, but they're here for your reference. This is about how many hours you might spend grade seven and eight doing certain activities. Um, and the majority of students are spending time with extracurricular activities in that light purple and exercising, which is, of course, great to see, and talking and texting on the phone. Not a ton of time spent working for money or volunteering amongst these middle school students, which makes sense, or attending religious services. Amongst high school students, uh, still you'll see a lot of time spent exercising or with extracurricular activities. Talking and texting on the phone has increased a bit here, um, with less time similar to middle school with working, volunteering, and religious services, or playing video games. Um, students in the middle school, 76.8% believe that they try hard to do good work at school. 55.2% um, definitely true that they feel safe at school, and 93.8% believe that they Definitely or mostly true believe that they feel safe at school. Um, teachers and staff are, are supporting youth to do their best at 95%, definitely or mostly true. And a similar pattern is seen at the high school with very high ratings of definitely or mostly true for those three indicators around school climate. When youth have a problem, how often do they? Um, come to their parents or guardians, their teachers, their friends, school personnel, or keep it to themselves. And it's nice to see that they reach out to their peers and their parents fairly consistently, both at the middle and high school. Um, oftentimes, they're keeping it to themselves as well. And um, that's OK in some circumstances. But I know we have great staff at our schools keeping an eye on these kids. Um, I like to look at these measures of emotional health and I tend to focus in on the depression indicator, I call it. I have felt sad or hopeless so much of the time that it stopped me from doing my usual activities. <coughs> and we have sometimes 20% of grade student in seven through eight feeling that way. And 4.9% stating they feel that way often or always. And looking at the line below that, if you're following in the table, I've seriously considered attempting suicide within the past year, uh, often or always at 2.7% for middle school and 4.9% at sometimes. These data are consistent with what I see in other communities, and I just think it's always good for um, the Board of Ed, the Youth Service Bureau, to, to have these indicators as a measure of what's happening around mental health. At the high school, those rates go up a bit, with 23.2% of youth having felt sad or hopeless um, sometimes, and 7.2% often or always. And then the suicide ideation question, 6.9% uh, report always, or sometimes, I'm sorry. And 2.8% report often or always. This is about hours spent with an adult present. So uh, the majority of youth have um, one to two hours without an adult on a given weekday. And then that goes up a little, of course, in the high school. You get some more independence. Um, and some students are not ever left alone. Um, these next tables, we're getting to the end, but this is about community safety and 96% of middle school, 93.2% feel that this is a safe community. 7.5% um, think that a lot of drugs are sold in the community for middle school students. And 32.3% of high school students believe a lot of drugs are sold in our community. Um, my experience with data is that when you compare a estimate of how many youth are using, how many youth do you believe are using in your grade? 
Um, the estimates are usually three times as much of actual um, use reported within a survey. So perception is a lot, but it's important to consider data as well. Um, these data are about uh, sending, receiving, feeling pressure to send sexually explicit photos of oneself. This is only asked for grades 9 through 12. Um, so of all students, 36.3% had electronically received what we refer to as a sext in the, in the survey. 13.5% felt pressured to send one, and 17.3% had actually sent a message of this nature. Um, you can see that for females, these rates are much higher amongst all categories, and this is consistent with the, what I've seen in other communities, and it's always been difficult for parents and community leaders to comprehend these data. And that is my last slide. I don't know if anyone has questions. I don't know if you have time for questions, but. <coughs> you said you compared it to older data? To older data. So mm -hmm. trend data for Weathersfield is tough to do. The only no, thing. No, but to older data. Was that one of the slides? Did I miss it? Oh, no. I was n oh. So maybe I misspoke in response to your question before. I was able to compare 2016 data to the state and the nation, but because we don't have previous data for Weathersfield, I couldn't provide trend. So beginning the, the data collection in 2016 allows us to collect data again in hopefully three to four years and begin to get those trend data captured. Okay, I thought you said you had data from around the country from prior years that you compared it to. No, okay. I'm sorry that I think we had a, a miscommunication. Right. The only thing we can do to compare data is again, look at community type find past data and match Weathersfield to it as a substitute data set. It's not an accurate measure for Weathersfield. It's close, but it's not 100%. So, so what are we supposed to do with this? Great question. So um, I've had the pleasure of working with the Youth Advisory Board now as a volunteer <coughs> since this survey has been done. And it's a really motivated group of folks. And their intention, and, and certainly, Erica, you're welcome to speak to this if you'd like. <laughs> Erica will explain the plan. So right now we're in the process of disseminating the information. Um, you were one of our first stops. Our, real, our next goal is to get this information out to students and parents. And then from there, really try to target um, what type of prevention work we're going to be focusing on when we're providing different types of resources and programs in the community. And we're looking to the Youth Advisory Board to help guide us through that. I was going to say, these are obviously worthy, worthy issues to look at, and this is very important. Um, just one thing that jumped out at me was the permission, prescription drug, alcohol, and marijuana with parents' permission at the junior high level. It seemed off the charts, and then it fell in high school again. So. I don't know whether that's a, a function of self, self-serving at the junior high age, or but it just it, it just jumped out at me as being <clears throat> something that's worth looking at the questions that are being asked or or trying to call that out. Well, it's consistent with what we do see in the communities is that middle school youth are reporting across the board <clears throat> for all substances accessing substances with or without their parents' permission. So the best thing we can do is understand sort of the, every community has its own culture, parenting culture, community culture, et cetera. Um, if we want to dig deeper into that, we may want to talk to some middle school youth in the form of a focus group, not self-reporting, right. but what do you hear about this amongst your peers and accessing these things in the home? Um, that's one means of digging down a little deeper to understand it, um, but it isn't inconsistent with what I see. Okay, yeah, I just... The alcohol, I said maybe that's cultural, someone has wine with dinner or something, but when it was prescription drug, and, it, and then it fell off in the high school, so it just, it's, worth a, yeah. it's worth a look as you're, as you're sure. moving forward. Sure. Are the questions that you ask the kids available somewhere for us to see? Yes, they are. We have them with the Department of Social and Youth Services downstairs. Okay, that yeah. might just help explain, because I sort of felt the same thing, Steve. It was kind of odd. <laughs> Absolutely, they Thank can you. get copies of that out. 
Um, just a question that I jumped out at me when I was looking at the results in, in the area of suicide. <clears throat> so if I looked at the respondent numbers and the percentages, particularly the sometimes or, or almost always numbers, um, it, in each of those grades, it, it's somewhere around 45, 50 respondents said they were seriously or often considering something with suicide if you look at the count. And uh, I guess, you know, not having any reference point, but would resources in our community at the high school or in the grade schools uh, find that number consistent with what they would expect or, or has it been reviewed with people who provide those services? Because that number seems high to me, you know, 40 or 50 uh, in the case of the high school grades are seriously considering suicide in this report. That seems like a big number to me. It does sound like a big number. I think the folks that work directly with youth, certainly youth service bureaus, um, we have Pam Harrison from the Youth Advisory Board who is from um, the high school as a school psychologist in the audience. They can speak to what they see in Weathersfield specifically. I don't know, Pam, do you find that number high? Pam does not. So, yeah, because it what strikes me that this would be a fairly honest response. It's almost an anonymous, safe response that I've thought about it often or always. And how, how many of those youth do you think make their way to you, you think, Pam? few times a week. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. 2.7% is, I just did the math, is about 31 kids at the school. I would say, if you say, what, two, two per, yeah. what? I mean, how many weeks of school are there? I think that's right in line. Hey, with Eric, if you want to, yeah, if you want to go up. Do you want to step up to the microphone? There's some, fo <coughs> there's some, <laughs> <laughs> the folks at home might want to hear this. I didn't dress appropriately here. I just, I look at that, that's a 30, about 31 kids. And I would say that's probably about what we deal with because we do commit people when they're made some kind of threat or there is some kind of threat to themselves or somebody else to the hospital. I would say twice a month, we probably send somebody to the hospital. So it's probably right in line with what those numbers speak of. And Eric Knapp is the school resource officer at the high school. I would say that's, there's pretty consistent with the middle school as well, working with the school psychologists, the social workers, and the school um, resource officer that they're seeing it come through their office. Yes. If you go back just one slide from this one, it'll tell you, unfortunately, though, that the kids are not going to their teachers or school personnel, but more to friends with their problems and guardians. Then the friends come to us, Pam says, yeah. to seek help for their peer. Okay. And remember, this is the often or always or almost always. So this is the go-to place. Sometimes, you know. It gets trickled through to them. Sounds but, like it, yeah. You know, is there more of a proactive response or um, an attempt to get to these kids before they even consider suicide? I know that the schools have brought in um, prevention programs, um, such as assemblies, advisory program, advisory program and um, different um, talks within the, the groups of students. Um, and they also are able to speak with their counselors at any given time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, just one other thing I was uh, sort of interested in. In each of the categories early on that you went through the charts, it talks about alcohol and uh, cigarettes, um, marijuana, and so forth. It doesn't quite spell out the advanced drugs like opiates and methane. And, and I went to a, a, a workshop last year that Weathersfield PD was involved with where they talked about the prevalence of uh, opiates and, and what was happening. It was much more significant, enough that I would have thought it would be included in this survey as a specific line item. That apparently, and yeah. we're hearing like with heroin coming out of Glastonbury and Hartford making their way into, not to pick on Glastonbury, but uh, we're hearing there's a lot of it coming in from Glastonbury. At least I heard in that report. W was there a reason that wasn't line item done this report as an item for people to respond to? I know you have it, oh, in, the, I know yes. you have it in here, 
lifetime we, use. But. We report, so in the beginning, when we look at those core substances as more of a highlight, we do that because those are the most commonly used substances and behaviors. Okay. And so here, um, you'll see the lifetime use rate. Is that in front of you now? Um, yes. One of these items is heroin. And I did the math um, and determined that at the high school level, we had 0.2% reporting heroin use in their lifetime, which came out to approximately two students. Now, something that you have to consider is, um, if you're really using heroin regularly, you are not necessarily attending school regularly. So that's one factor, is your, your functionality is limited if you're deep into this addiction. Um, there may be a hesitance to report. Um, I think, again, the folks at the high school can speak better to what they see rather than what our data tell us. I mean, we do know that heroin use increases after high school exponentially, but it is, at this point in time, less common to see high school students using heroin regularly to the extent that we don't even get a 30-day use rate out of it. We get a lifetime use rate. So anecdotally, I do believe that there is a notion in every community I visit that this is a youth, young adult, across the spectrum, the age spectrum issue. But our data um, from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance System data, uh, monitoring the future, these data right here, none of them have indicated that this is a youth problem. But certainly these problems that we do see are precursors to other problems. Okay. Anything else, guys? Okay. Thank, thank you thank for you. taking thank time you. to present. We just want to say thank you, and these, this conversation we want to continue with um, stakeholders in the community, so we appreciate the feedback and the questions, and feel free, if you have any others, to contact us. Yes. Um, and we just want to keep the conversation going and dig a little deeper into the, the data. So thank you and have a good night. Thank, thank you. Okay, um, public comment this evening. We'll move into public comment. Anyone wishing to speak this evening on any topic of interest? Uh, Deb? Hi, everyone. Uh, Deborah Cohen, 73 Church Street. Um, I've got two things that I would just like to mention this evening, and I'll try to be quick about both of them. I'm still in the process of learning how our town works. And a lot of it makes me really happy, but some of it is just leaving me stumped. So here's the first thing. Um, last, on August 24th, I believe, on the meeting here, I came and I made a request that the town council um, consider taking action or at least starting a public conversation about making public our town stand on the degrees to which we will and will not cooperate with ICE. Um, and the last, one of the things that I learned at that time was that there's not a back and forth between public comments and those of you on the council at these meetings. So my last comment on the 24th was, I really hope to hear from somebody about how this may go forward. I would like to be part of the conversation. So that was over a month ago. And I don't know how, how communication is or is not expected back from town council members. I don't know if you can tell me that now, because this is sort of a question. Um, but I am a little concerned that when we come to you, well, I'll just speak for myself. I'm concerned that if I come to you with um, a, a concern that I would really like to go forward with, it's really, really important to me, and I think to many people in town, that there be some response, excuse me, <clears throat> even if that response is, Deborah, we've got a lot on our plate and we can't th think about this now, maybe we'll think about it later, even that would be better than just wondering, 
Is it just going to lie there and not go anyplace? So that was the first thing that I wanted to say tonight. And related to that, um, hoping that you will be considering my request that we can get something, some sort of conversation and resolution going in town. I have um, copies of some information here that I would like to leave with Dolores that she can uh, share with you. One is a copy of the Connecticut Trust Act, and it comes from um, the governor's office. It will give you very straight in, um, forward information about the details that I think we need to look at. Um, I'm not asking that we make new policy. I'm not asking that we start doing things any differently than we have been. I'm asking that we make a public statement about what we are currently doing. And the other two things that I have, um, one is a copy of a resolution coming from Bloomfield, and another is a resolution that recently came from the town of Wyndham that addresses just this, um, just this issue. If we go online, we can find those resolutions from the larger cities. We can find New Haven, we can find Hartford, but I specifically wanted to share with you the resolutions that are coming from towns that we can more, uh, that we're more likely to identify with. So if you don't mind, I will leave this. Thank you. And the second thing that I wanted to um, make some comments about, they're actually quite related. Several months ago, I was very happy to be named to the Human Rights and Relations Commission here in town. So I contacted <clears throat> Town Hall and I got a list of the names and contact information for people who were on that commission. I sent a letter of um, introduction for myself. I was asking if folks could give me the history of the commission, what they have been working on, what they're looking forward to working on in the future. And what I learned uh, was, um, that the commission has not met in over three years. I was shocked. I spoke with Mr. Bridges <laughs> on the phone, and my understanding from that conversation is that town commissions need a town employee to participate as part of the commission, and that no one is available at this time with all of the concerns that are facing us budget-wise. But that doesn't tell me why it hasn't been gathering for <coughs> over three years. And this really concerns me. You know, the world is pretty much falling apart around us. I think that here in Weathersfield, most of us are lucky to live pretty safe lives. But I know that this town has issues that need um, attention. But also, the Human Rights and Relations Commission, as I read in this that I got off um, the web. It's also supposed to be a commission to bring positive things to town. It's a, it's, it's a commission that's supposed to come up with activities and things to bring our communities together, the various communities that live here in town. That's what I want to do. It's what several people um, who are listed as being part of the commission even though it hasn't met um, for some time are interested in doing. I have started hearing from people so I guess I'm leaving you with another question tonight that I understand you can't answer tonight, but what do we need to do to get this town commission going? It's listed as part of the town. Um, there are rules and regulations according to which, um, one of them is that it's supposed to meet six times a year. And that's not happening. So I guess I'm, what I'm saying is, number one, if it's not going to be a real commission, why is it listed? And why are people invited to join it? I had no idea that these conditions um, were in effect when I asked to be named to it. Um, and then what can we do to put this commission together? We need it. You've got people who really want to serve and volunteer their time. So as <coughs> I ended my comments last time, I will say I am looking forward to hearing from council members about what we can do about this. Thanks. Other public comment? <coughs> Bob? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, 
regarding the lady that was just up here to ask about not cooperating with ICE, I, I, I don't know how anybody can do that. We have rules, we have laws, we don't pick and choose what laws are on the books we're supposed to follow. I know towns don't follow all the rules, but I don't think something like that we should get, even get involved in. And to be assimilated with towns like Bloomfield, Wyndham, New Haven, Hartford, we don't want to get anywhere near those places. We don't want to have any contact with those people in those towns because they don't simulate as we do. They're not like us, they're different. So I would advise you to keep away from this issue. The, uh, the um, conversation that was earlier going on regarding uh, the survey uh, sets up a lot of different ideas and thoughts. You know, and you came up with some ideas, Mayor, about the or discussion about suicides, and you know, it brings a lot of things to the surface. And uh, yeah, I guess it might serve a purpose somewhere down the line. Um, at the last town council meeting, there was a lot of discussion about the town sets. Town was to set the temporary car tax mill rate. And, you know, Mayor, you, you kept harping that it should be at $37. And it seemed like that's all you wanted was the $37 per thousand. And I guess the town has decided it's only going to be 32. But why would you, you know, I mean, granted, I know your tax borrow and spend all the way right through your heart. But to keep asking for $37 when you're only entitled to 32, I think is wrong. And I'm glad that someone made the decision to keep it 32. I did get my tax bill and uh, I hate paying those taxes. Next, in my water bill recently, I get this notice of sewer and water assessment rate increase. This is for new hookups, I take it from what I've read. It's not for existing people. But they had a current rate of $53 for the sewer assessment, $53.40, and effective uh, October 1st of uh, 2017, it's going to be $72.77. Tremendous, tremendous increase. Then the next year, it's going to be $92.14. And the following year, 2019, it's going to go to $111.50 per thousand foot or per foot rate. This is horrendous. Our inflation is nothing. Yet these guys want continuation of higher and higher rates. And who is the one that said it? It says on August 7th, 2017, the Metropolitan District Commission voted to increase the rates for sewer and water assessments, effective October 1st, 2017, and it goes on. You know, that, that these rates are for, not for the current people who are connected, but for the new people. So what I can say is MDC are representatives, and I believe we have three of them from Weathersfield that sit up there, voted in favor of this. I think those people should be taken to task for increasing this water rate and saying hello to whoever wants to move in here, welcome. We're going to nail you with a much higher rate than your neighbors. I think this is pathetic of the water company. And I think it's absolutely pathetic of our representatives who you folks nominate and, and, and approve to sit up on the board of the MDC. They vote, and they did the same thing with the water. $41, $59, $77.95. Welcome to the community. That's what it says. Be ready to pay. We're dead in the water with people running this water company and these commissioners that we have. Just the other, just last week, the city bond rating has been lowered more for the city of Hartford. I, I can't wait till they go through bankruptcy. And I think bankruptcy is the one and only way to solve their problems up there. 
They are overloaded with, with costs that nobody cared about. We had the same problem here. Nobody cares about it until the bill comes. And then you still don't care about it. You call it fixed costs. Then I notice in the paper, the Maple grind, uh, Giant Grinder Company is closing Saturday, and they said it's too expensive to do business in Harford. How many other companies have said goodbye to Harford? Harford's going to be a ghost town. And we know what's, ha what's happened with the insurance companies, not that their general work is leaving, but their corporate offices are going, and there, there's a lot of things happening. And of course, we have the $140 million that we just spent on Yukon, another waste of money. And what, what interests me, Mayor, is the, the the governor turns down a budget that was voted on. Our guy voted for it, Mr. Doyle. And he turns it down. He vetoes it. And where does that leave the rest of us? That budget would have given us how much? $9 million. <clears throat> the budget that Mr. Malloy puts into place as of October 1st gives us what? Zero? He's a great guy. He's a great guy that has a lot to do, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, deep heart feelings for education. I mean, he, he talks about education and spending for the future when he talks about Yukon, but for the, for the commu 85 communities out in the state of Connecticut, he says, that's what you get out of his budget. The other budget would have given us all that money, and he said, no. Guy is a screwball. I know he's your buddy. I know you guys are bosom friends, but he, he's a loser. And the sooner we get him out of here, the better. Okay, Bob. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll I also wrap. noticed. Excuse me, Bob. Your five minutes is up. My five minutes are up. Oh, I wanted to talk about some more issues. I look forward to your second five. Uh, I'll hang around. Thank you. Thank I'm you, sure sir. You will. You're welcome. Somebody else wouldn't speak, Tom? Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. It's a tough act to follow, Bob. A um, couple items. On the agenda tonight, there's a, a bid for the Stillman roof. And I just had a couple comments for your consideration. Um, there's a there's a listed in there architectural project management services of fifteen thousand dollars, and I'm not sure if that's already been spent. If uh, an architect or a project manager has, you know, provided a detailed work scope that was used to prepare the bid. Um, my my concern with this project is uh, a good portion of the roof is slate uh, with the top portion being a flat roof. Um, it looks like the intent is to go ahead and use natural slate rather than a synthetic uh, slate roof. I was hoping that a architectural asphalt shingle roof would have been considered, but evidently that didn't make the cut. Um, using a slate roof, I think, is a fantastic way to go. There's not that much cost difference, and if it's installed properly, we should get 100 years out of it. None of us will have to worry about it in our lifetime. <clears throat> the point is that it's not very commonly used, and uh, a lot of the techniques for installing slate roofs have gone away. There's not that many companies that still do it on a regular basis. And while Silktown Roofing may have done an excellent job on the high school project, that's a flat uh, membrane type roof. It's not a slate roof. And so I have some concerns that one, either the work scope's not detailed enough to allow the actual workers to install this slate properly, or that the project management has overseen slate roof installations. So I hope you'll consider that tonight when you uh, uh, vote on approving that. 
Uh, the second item I wanted to speak about is uh, tomorrow night there's a planning and zoning agenda on the planning and zoning agenda is a pre-application hearing for millennial living at 170 Ridge Road which is a former CCMC school on the corner of Ridge and Jordan Lane and the project description states that 34 units of market rate apartments are being proposed <clears throat> this added to the 64 units at 291 Ridge Road which is under construction and the approved but not yet started 111 units at 1078 Silestine Highway brings the total to 209 units of market rate uh, apartments. Uh, does Weathersfield really need more apartments? I've listened to the presentations for the first two projects and can almost guarantee that the presentation tomorrow night will be along the same lines. First being that this is what Weathersfield needs to retain and attract young people. The development won't strain the school system in town because millennials evidently don't reproduce. It won't increase traffic because the volumes are so low it doesn't even require a traffic study as was the case on Ridge Road. And we're cleaning up a blighted eyesore that has been on the corner of Jordan and Ridge for as long as I can remember. And the last item that always gets brought up, but not usually at the initial presentation, is that we will need some taxpayer money, bonds, loans, or tax abatements, so that we, the developers, can make more money. So my question is, does Weathersfield have an economic development plan? Are more apartments <coughs> stated in that plan? That's what, that's what we're proposing to do. How about businesses? Are they in the economic development plan? Uh, more shops, restaurants, maybe higher end shopping. Uh, I know in my household, most of our shopping's done out of town. We go over the border to restaurants. We go over the borders to buy clothing and whatever other things, grocery stores. Your bigger grocery stores are not in town. Um, <clears throat> there's some information going around in some promotional information that says that there's 93 new businesses have been brought into Weathersfield. Um, I'm wondering where they are. I don't see them. I still see a lot of empty stores on the South Scene Highway. Are, how is that number even constructed? Are those businesses that came in to replace businesses that either moved out or failed? Uh, is it spread over a number of years? It's, you know, 93 businesses over 10 years, so we got nine new ones a year. Uh, I'd like a little clarification on that. I just don't see the development there, and I'm, I'm wondering what's being done in town to address that. We have an economic development department and uh, I know I've spoken to Miramont and Erie about it off the record, and uh, Paul's been one of the big promoters of Weathersfield, and he's uh, done a good job of getting businesses in here, but he's leaving. So what's the plan going forward? In another couple months, we'll have new people up here, and, uh, you know, what's the plan? Is, is there a written plan, and are we following it? Or do we just react to people that come into town and say, we want to put some more apartments up? And, we'll, and then our economic development department does whatever they can to assist these people in, in getting these projects approved. But they may not be the projects that the town wants or needs. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. Anything else this evening? Barbara? My name is Barbara Rue. I live at 79 Main Street. My dad was here a couple weeks ago, and I said he said thank you for the pond, but there was a person who didn't get here who really thanks you, and that's my mom. Because the pond project was scheduled at such a time where my dad was home for six weeks, couldn't drive because of eye surgery. 
So he took his lawn chair out, sat in the driveway, and supervised every inch of it. I remember the pond because I grew up next to it, and the whole town council was invited to my wedding because my dad wanted the pond to look nice, and somehow they managed that, and that was 47 years ago. So that's your chuckle for the evening. A more serious note, what's rung through my head all day is a verse from, I think it was Pete Seeger's, these are terrible times, these are the times that try the souls of men. And we can't wake up one day without having a terrible tragedy. We're very lucky in this town, and I think the presentation that you served, the survey that Youth Service Advisory Board had, had put in place is really worth thinking about. Our children are our greatest treasure, and we're very lucky in this town. We have a lot of committed people. We have a lot of sports activities. We have a lot of activities. And it's our hope as the Youth Service Advisory Board to bring people together to really see that our kids get what they need. And it's not always money. It's usually just people. The board is rich in resources. We have a prosecutor. We have a juvenile court public defender. We have a school psychologist. We have a volunteer statistician. And I've got a little bit of experience working with kids in the, in the court system. And we have a vision for what we would like to see. So I hope you, it was, you know, it's a lot of statistics. It's a lot of graphs and charts. But we have a plan, and we hope you'll walk along with us. The third thing I want to say is to sort of follow up something Deb Cohen said. I am the daughter and the granddaughter and the grandniece and the mother and the mother-in-law of immigrants and refugees that have lived through incredible things. Evidently, in, the, in, the, in one of the censuses I read, I was counted as foreign-born because I was first generation. English was not my first language. As I watch what goes on in this country with refugees and ICE, I grieve because these are real people. As a lawyer, I've sworn to uphold the law and the Constitution. But above that, I'm a person of faith. And my faith says we have to look out for each other. We have to find a way as a community, as a state, and as a country to straighten this mess out. And if it means that we're a little kinder to people who are without papers, what was the derogatory term, WAP, without papers? Many of us may have some of that in our background. It's my hope that we can be compassionate and we can be kind and we can remember that we came out of a rebellion and a little bit of rebellion every now and again doesn't hurt. So I would hope we find a way and I would hope that our local enforcement individuals do not feel they have to cooperate. And I know that on a pure legal sense that is wrong, but on a humanitarian sense, it is right. And it may come to that towns like Wethersfield will see what New Haven saw, which is a community of faith that opens their door and says we are a sanctuary. So I would like just to think about those things. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Other public comment this evening? Okay, thank you. Um, council reports. <coughs> council reports this evening. Okay, Tony. Uh, there was a meeting last week of the uh, Senior Citizens Advisory Commission, and I just want to make the seniors aware out there that uh, uh, social services has been getting phone calls. Uh, I guess uh, Medicare is doing a beneficiary survey. It is not a scam. It's being run out of the office of the CMS Office of Enterprise Data and Analysis in partnership with the uh, University of Chicago National Opinion Research Center. And uh, if you get a call and you're afraid to respond to it, take their number, check with social services and call them back. Uh, it, it is not a scam, so we, we want to just, you know, help you rest assured on that. Uh, also, the EDIC Marketing Subcommittee met last week and they're starting plans for the uh, annual Salute to Business in December. Uh, they're looking at uh, selecting the uh, winners for this year's awards. And the uh, Veterans Day Committee had their first planning meeting last week. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, having that ceremony on Friday, November the 10th. 
which also happens to be the uh, Marine Corps birthday. Uh, so uh, those are what's in the works. Thank you very much, Tony. Mike Rell. Uh, the HDC uh, lost, uh, I think I mentioned it a couple uh, months ago, Kristen Strolley, who was a longtime um, coordinator for the HDC. Um, she and her family had to move um, out of state. We, uh, the commission replaced her with uh, a gentleman for only about a month or two. He unfortunately left the town, but for um, greener pastures, he took a full-time job that has him going down to Stamford. Unfortunately, we won't have him anymore, but having talked to uh, um, the town manager, Jeff had uh, assured us that uh, there will be a replacement for that coordinator, uh, hopefully coming on board pretty soon. So I'm looking forward to working with uh, a new uh, HDC coordinator for the district. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Amy? The library board met last week and they reelected their officers and uh, then they asked the town manager to attend their meeting so he could bring them up to speed on the state budget and uh, they expressed some concerns on how that state budget may impact the library budget. Thank you, Amy. Council comments? Mike Hurley? Um, there was a cleanup at the Cove a couple weeks ago. It was nice to see a lot of the high school, well, I would say half of the people down there were from the high school. It was nice to see a lot of the volunteers took about a little over a ton of trash out of the uh, Cove area. Thanks, Mike. Tom? Um, thanks, Mike, for bringing it up. And that was one that I missed, one of the very few I missed. <laughs> uh, I was so sorry, I had other obligations. I would just like to thank my, um, my peers um, for the nice letter that was in Weathersfield Life um, thanking me for my service. Um, I know I'll get to, to say more at a different time, but I was um, touched by everyone's words, so thank you so much. Thanks, Donna. I did read that letter, and uh, I know sometimes the party stuff, I would have gladly signed that. I agreed with everything they put in there wholeheartedly, having served with you all these years. I'm sure others would have as well. Other comments? Tony? Uh, I just wanted to say last week we had the uh, ribbon cutting for Chipotle's. They opened last Thursday. Uh, the ribbon cutting was at 1045 and there were people outside waiting in line to come in uh, to eat. It was a real nice place down there. They are real energetic and looking for people coming forward. Thanks. Uh, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, <coughs> Cheeks Chicken Waffles opened on the Salestine Highway last, uh, for their grand opening was last Sunday. They opened on a Sunday. Their grand opening was a Sunday. They had a fanfare down there. Their chicken is actually, it's a funny name, but their chicken, chicken's pretty good. You should go down there and have some. It is good. I'll echo that. Thanks, Mike. Um, a couple of things. Um, I want to clarify uh, the car tax cap position since Mr. Young stated it incorrectly. Um, I think people are aware of this that uh, in our discussion about having to put out the car bills in response to a cash flow requirement that was expressed by our town manager and our finance director, uh, my advocacy for the 37 versus the 32 reflects what I believe will be the final outcome at the budget process, but under council advice uh, from our town attorney, uh, because that budget has not been passed, we were on a slippery slope, and I think most councilors agreed that to impose the 37 without that having been rectified uh, could result in some question being raised by residents who received that bill. I'm not advocating for an increased tax on our residents. I'll remind our residents that the property tax reform intent of SB1 that was passed two years ago was to begin a process of reducing the pressure on our residents for car tax in exchange for a pool being created uh, at the state level uh, that would replenish the, the cap uh, reduction that was being proposed on towns that have a cap above the 32, which was the original intent. We all know what's happening with the state. We all know that the ability for the state to replenish, and, I, and I've talked to our delegation about repealing that bill in absence of the ability to honor its intent. But having said that, um, my intent was to avoid the, the need to issue a second bill 
uh, for car tax, which I, I think Jeff had characterized as going to cost the town about $20,000 to do, which unfortunately we probably will have to do. So in fact, quite contrary to what Mr. Young said, I was hoping to save our taxpayers some money, not add to their burden, but just to clarify that misrepresentation. Um, Deb, I want to thank you for your continued interest in the topic of diversity and uh, the motions that you've done. I want to be sure that I share publicly that I've exchanged some information with Deb about some alternatives in response to uh, her interest and support what she is trying to do. But I also want to publicly share that I shared with Deb that it's my belief that there are several collaborators in town that need to be involved in that discussion, that there are uh, constituent groups, including police, social services, youth services, senior services, and as evidenced by some co public commentary, there are some residents who uh, I think would want a voice in any move that this town would make to position itself with a public statement similar to any of these other towns. And I suggested to Deb that it would be my intent to get some of those folks together to begin to have some dialogue with them that would uh, take place over the next couple of months, not to be dismissive of, I think, Deb's urgency to get it done. So I just want to be sure I, I'm, I'm publicly sharing. Also, with respect to the uh, Commission on Human Rights, that commission hasn't met not because of uh, disinterest or um, uh, lack of concern about any public right, uh, uh, public human rights issues, but there has not been any raised issues in the last several years. And, and under our various commissions that re residents are volunteering their time, we've had to juggle that a little bit. Obviously, this issue is on the surface and will probably inspire a need for us to do something. And I, I think you'll know, you'll agree, Deb, I shared with you that I thought one alternative would be to create an ad hoc committee that might more expediently get some residents involved in that discussion. And if that's not acceptable as an alternative, we can certainly engage in some future discussion. But um, I just want to be sure that the council knows uh, that I have uh, reached out to Deb and communicated some alternatives. And I think we just need to have um, some input uh, and some participation. Um, the concept of um, sanctuary cities and diversity statements and so forth, in my opinion, uh, would not be best served by just simply putting that out as a council, I don't, I would, I don't want to be presumptive, but I would think that this council would say they would want input from several people before we would, uh, excuse me, necessarily take a position on behalf of our entire community that may not be shared. So um, I, I certainly have had conversations with Deb and very much appreciate her uh, energy behind this. But uh, again, it's not that it's not something we're interested in, but I just think there's several steps um, and I don't want that to sound like a circling the wagons and not getting something done. It's, it's important, I think, to many residents, certainly important to Deb and several constituents that have shared that. Um, and I just want to be sure everybody understands uh, we're, we're treating that with its respect. Um, lastly, um, with respect to Tom's comments about uh, the apartments, um, I, I would direct you back, Tom, to a report that was done with the Borden property by Barton Associates out of Philadelphia that was part of a report that was submitted to this council in support of that project. And you'll see in there if you, and it's available in Peter's office, by the way, uh, Peter Gillespie, uh, that somewhere north of 600 apartments are recommended by that report as uh, an appetite in our area that's unmet by our current residential. Uh, you know, Barton has been a pretty well respected residential analysts uh, for Greater New England in the Hartford area particularly. They were involved with the projects in Glastonbury, West Hartford, and Newington, and participated in the report that was crafted for us to support the Borden project, which uh, I think is 112 apartments. Um, so if you look at that report, and I put some value in it because it's pretty competent professionals, uh, they suggest that there's a well unmet need there. Now, I don't know about the project on Jordan Lane and Ridge. I haven't heard about that until you mentioned it tonight. Uh, we haven't been involved in that. Don't know where that will go with P and Z, but um, I certainly think the Ridge Road property and the one on Silas Dean that's proposed uh, is well south of that uh, that particular need. But I'd leave it to the P and Z folks and Jeff and Peter to continue to evaluate that along with everything else. Um, and as far as the number of businesses that have opened and how that's being put out. I would direct you back again to Peter, who has that complete report. That, I believe, is a period of time that crosses over three and a half years of, of businesses. Some of it is uh, replacing ones that have closed. But Peter uh, indicated to me a, a six weeks ago that we have almost 100% occupancy in town. And I think some years ago we had, um, I think, 48 
open spaces that were available, and I, I believe we only have three right now. They're all in discussion right now to be filled, minus and go a few things. But um, and then lastly, that that master plan that you refer to that you hope exists does exist, and Peter does work off of it. Um, and I think it's a it's a document that's in his office that hasn't been updated in about a year and a half, but um, I think would be also useful reading in terms of what you're talking about. So. Um, you raise excellent points, of course, and encourage you to continue to stay active, as I know I've shared with you privately. Very much appreciate your, your interest in what is happening in the town, um, but I do think those documents are important to have for purposes of sharing accurate uh, material that we have used, I think, to weigh in on uh, how things are done uh, with respect to what, what uh, some of that we've been involved with, and some of it happens naturally, of course, without our participation, but I think uh, I think everybody at the, the council, both sides agree that we're making good progress in town. Want to keep that going, especially in light of the other budgetary strains from the state. Okay. Joe. I just have a request because I think I've asked for that report before. Do we have that in a PDF or a link that we can? Which one, Joy? The master plan. Sure. I'll have Peter get get it the, to council. The uh, town master plan, conservation development. Is it an economic development plan? Well, there's economic development within the plan. So it's not a master plan for economic development per se? No, it's a plan of conservation and development. That's, that's on the website. So we can have Peter here at the next meet. It would just be interesting because I'm curious when that was done because you said it was updated a year and a half ago. I think in terms of matching what had happened with the particulars within it. Where are we at? Where were we not at? And I think Peter reported on it at that time, a couple year and a half, two years ago, in terms of it. It's not. It's not one of these things that's been dusty. But I think obviously it's a master. Right. So there should be like some benchmarks sure. that we should be hitting. So I'd be curious to yeah. see what's going on. I think it is good to have Peter come. Okay. And then get that report out. Thank that's you. Fine. Thanks, Jody. Okay. <clears throat> Anything, Jeff? Yeah, a couple things. Um, kind of operating in the background of everything else. Um, a couple years ago, the state required CRA, or now MIRA, to undergo a process to find out what's gonna be next for that facility in terms of how it's gonna process waste. Uh, as you know, the MIRA plant is aged. It has a very short lifespan now without significant uh, modification or um, capital investment. So <clears throat> last week, Sally attended a public meeting in Hartford with the three proposal finalists to replace that plant. And uh, we'll have some more information to you all at the next meeting. Comments are due on these proposals by October 20th. Uh, the three proposing companies are waste management, which is the largest in the, on the planet in terms of waste management. Covanta, which operates, already operates a waste energy plant in Connecticut, and then the Last one, Saker, Rooney, I didn't that I've heard of before, but they represent interests in uh, landfilling, um, which is not proposed in Connecticut. Um, just in general, you know, waste energy, bio, uh, biosolid, ref, you know, recycling, those kind of things. So uh, we'll have a report for you next meeting and then some proposed comments to, to go to the committee. So also, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Young hit on a little bit this evening. The MDC budgetary juggernaut continues. We attended a uh, budget meeting with them, proposed budget meeting with them uh, last week. Um, Ad valorem is proposed to go to up 11%. It's early in the process yet, but their initial run was 11% increase to ad valorem. There's a $3 per month increase in the sewer bill per user for sewer customer support. Um, and then the water rate will go up over 11%. And that's first draft. Um, yes. Leaf collection, uh, later on Sally can answer any questions. We are going to start leaf collection soon. The schedule will be out in the next week or so uh, for that. And then finally, we've gotten a lot of interest from the different cell companies to put, for lack of a better word, a, a canister on top of different light poles through towns to enhance signal service. So AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, uh, which has a kind of a different product, are all seeking approval through, through Pura to have these around. So at some point we'll see these, which basically look like a tall beer can sitting on top of a telephone pole. 
but your cell server should be enhanced. Um, and that's what I have. Thank you, Chap. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Laura, anything? Uh, as of October uh, 6th, this Friday, we'll have absentee ballots ready for the elections. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move into council action. I believe there's one appointment. Do you want to add to the agenda the minutes first? Um, yeah, we can do that. Why don't I take a motion for that? Uh, make a motion to add to the agenda item B6C, approval of the uh, special meeting minutes of September 28, 2017. We were handed tonight. I'll second. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Abstain. Abstain. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the appointment, Tony? Oh, to the Senior Senior Citizens Advisory, Advisory Committee, uh, Henry Hornat of 33 Mill Street, Unit 5, for the period 10-1-17 to 6-30-19. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Um, 3A, Emergency Management Grant. Uh, Motion to approve the grant request for an emergency management performance grant. Second. We have a motion and a second, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. This is an annual grant that's offered to the town, <clears throat> and we've received it for the past 10 years or so. It's used to offset some costs in the director's stipend. Okay. Any questions on this from Council? Very straightforward. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. B3B. Make a motion to approve the write off of the 2001 uncollectible taxes per the request of the Weathersfield tax collector. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Marlene, I assume, is here for that. Yes. Good evening. Um, the 2001 list has now become the 16th year, which, pursuant to the 12 164 of the Connecticut General Statutes, is now uncollectible. So I'd like permission to be able to write those accounts off. Questions for Marlene on this? Is this larger than normal or around the same? It is because um, personal property and motor vehicle is showing up on there. In the past, it used to be suspended, but technically suspense is anything that's either deceased or bankrupt. And these accounts were just, un they were unable to find them. Technology has enhanced that. We're able to find people better now, and with businesses, we're able to track down the owners, so we're more on top of it than they were when these were due. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I just want to reiterate before we vote that, again, uh, Marlene's work over the several plus years that she's been here has resulted in a lot more collection in this regard. And I think we also worked with a couple of agencies that helped get some of the loose end amounts collected as well. So this might be a hair more this year, but overall, as, uh, as you'll recall, one of the transfers we had reflected additional revenue from her efforts. I just want to make sure we thank her again for that. I'm glad you're still with us working as hard as you are. So we have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thanks, Marlene. Thank you. B3C. I'd like to make a motion to approve the meeting dates of the Weathersfield Town Council for the year 2018. Second. Motion to second. Any questions about this? It's under charter requirement. Jeff, do you at this time want to eliminate one in July and August like you've done in the past? I'll leave that up to Dolores. I think she's identified the ones she's looked at. Did right. I read it wrong? No, there's no. We left them all in this year, but um, the ones that we usually uh, we have done last few years is the first one in July and the first one of uh, August. I might, I might just make the suggestion that, that that decision about if they are to be removed, I would recommend be uh, left to the new council mm -hmm. as opposed to this council since it'll be a different leadership group uh, that should be involved in that decision. So I'd recommend we keep this approval as is and allow that to happen at okay. appropriate time in the future. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Other questions about that? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, bids. 4A. Motion to accept the bid from Silktown Roofing, Inc., including alternates one and two, for a total contract of 
$247,330, also including a $5,000 contingency, and make the necessary transfers from the funds outlined above to pay for the improvements and project management. Second. Motion is second. Sally, thank you. I know you're here. Hi. Take us through it. Okay. Um, when the issue of the stillman roof was brought to us, the first thing that we undertook was quite an extensive study to find an architect who was um, knowledgeable about not only historical architecture, but also building envelope uh, work. We came upon Carl Rothbart, who is a partner of the Architectural Preservation Studio. They have done an extensive amount of work on historic homes, historic buildings, uh, commercial buildings that are historic use, uh, just a myriad of different types of buildings, historic buildings. We met with Carl, vetted him quite uh, significantly, and um, then went under contract with him to draw up the documents to specify the work to be done at the Stillman building. Within his documents, he explained, we've, we also met with the historic district on twi three occasions actually, to discuss the different types of materials that they would accept to be used on that building. Um, we discussed everything from asphalt shingles to slate to slate type products. Um, the historic district did approve the use of the Da Vinci slate product. Also, they gave their um, support, obviously, if we wanted to use natural slate. We met with Carl, discussed these issues, discussed what we wanted to look at, at the products. He took that information. He and his colleagues and myself went up on the roof and did quite an extensive study photo photographing and measuring the roof the way the roof has been put together, the gutters and other work that needed to be done. Carl then went back and wrote the specifications that we used to bid the, <coughs> the job. We had a pre-bid meeting with uh, roofing companies and other that would be interested in bidding on the project. Carl was there, I was there, Fred Bushy was there, and we thoroughly walked through every page of the specifications, giving people the opportunity to ask questions about uh, the type of materials, the application, the scope, and the specifications, the bid process, and the timing. We had approximately 16 people um, come to that meeting. We then gave them op ample opportunity to bid on the project. We received, um, we received, excuse me, sorry, uh, seven bids. Silk Town Roofing um, did come in as the lowest bid, lowest, most responsible bid. We met again with Carl and his colleagues to go through all of the bids to make sure that we were comparing like items. And he too um, gave his approval to use Silk Town Roofing if we, if we move forward with this project. Um, as part of the uh, specifications, we did add in two alternates. One, as I said, was to use natural slate. The other was also to do some work on the wood cornices because if you look at that building, if you replace the roof and not work on parts of the roof, it's going to look unfinished and undone. And so doing um, the roof, the cornices, gives you a complete project which you can hopefully walk away from for a number of years. Okay, questions for Sam? Go ahead, Amy. Um, is this project going to be completed this fall? That is our intent. Because um, roofing can be done when you get into the colder weather because you're not worrying about paint drying, you know, if something like that. We feel that if we do move on this, the roofing companies felt that they would be able to get it done before the real winter weather uh, sets in now. And do you feel that this project needs to get done at this time? There are significant issues with that roof. Uh, when, and I will say that my eyes were opened even more when I actually went up onto the roof. That slate is literally disintegrating. And it is shocking to see 
the condition of that roof. I know that there are many interior spaces in that building that have had significant damage in them. And then my other question is, has um, Silktown Roofing installed slate roofs before? They have indicated that they have had um, experience in doing these types of applications. We did not delve deep into um, every single project they've ever worked on, but they are a reputable, well-versed um, roofing company that um, in their bid gave us the information that we requested as per Carl specifications. But that did indicate they had experience with that. Yes, use. yes, they did indicate that they have used these products before. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Mike Curley? Um, just to follow up, I guess, with Amy. So we didn't get any references from any of the roofs that they've done before for Slate? For Slate specific, no, yeah. we did not. Okay, I would think that, I mean, these, these roofs supposedly <coughs> last a long time. I would think that maybe we would hold off until we got maybe a, like a specific kind of reference to them doing some good jobs on some roofing. Because the other bids, a few of the other bids didn't seem too much out of line from them. I'd ra if this thing's going to last 50 or 60 years, I think maybe going a few extra steps might be appropriate for this case. Yeah. It is a very straightforward application. Um, and Silk Town Roofing has been exceptionally responsive to us in all of the roofing that they have done on the, on the high school project. I will say that from, from our experiences with them. The quality of the workmanship that they have shown has been very good. No, I get that. I just was wondering about the, the slate roof. That's one of the more unusual roofs that we have in town. No, um, so it's been used in a lot of buildings. It's really not an unusual product. It's just an expensive product, and so a lot of people don't use it. But there are a number of buildings that have slate roofs. But we don't know how experienced they are with slate? As I said, I, we didn't um, go out and, and solicit a number of, of specific slate roof references from them. Just a proposal to make it a contingency. We'll do the references. Mm -hmm. That way, we're not yes. burning two weeks. Okay. Right. No, I can. <clears throat> I can, can we'll, certainly do that within and we'll a short back on, the, on the slate roof, the specific slate roof. Okay. They did have a list of references that were positive, mm -hmm. but yes, we'll, we'll make sure we narrow down to a slate, to the slate roof ones, and get them to you. But approved okay. tonight, contingent upon that. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. That's a good approach. You go with that, Mike. Donna. Yep. Just have one more question. Um, I'm just trying to remember the Da Vinci type of roof. Is that slate or is that a synthetic? It's a synthetic. What they they call it Da Vinci slate. That is the title of the pro of the. the but it's a synthetic product. Yes. product. Yes. So it's not quote. Slate. Slate. Okay. Right. And it it carries with it obviously then a, a different warranty and right. all that. Okay. Thank you. Mike. Sally, thank you. Uh, last couple of meetings you've come to, uh, you've been grilled not only from this side but from, you know, a number of councilmen and councilwomen on various issues. Uh, most recently the repainting of the Standish House yes. and um, actually went and um, talked to the historic uh, historical society and um, I mentioned that I opposed it and I did bring up your name and they said that uh, unfortunately eight years ago when it was repainted the first time you were not on town staff at the time and that could have led to why um, some of the problems existed at that time and then you know carried over to here. So it's good to hear from the public that you're doing an outstanding job and without a doubt, you know, I have the utmost confidence in, in you and your staff um, to do that. Um, with that said, I did over the weekend go to a number of um, Board of Ed uh, administrators and ask them, you know, what's going on in the um, Stillman building. Um, it's much different than, you know, looking at the outside of a building and needing paint and, you know, cosmetic. Mm -hmm for lack of a better term, work. Um, they all had 
various comments to stay, say about it, but there's on the second floor some tent work, piping, tubing, funneling into barrels of rainwater as it comes in. Mm -hmm. um, as well, um, drywall has been completely ruined, mold, the fear of mold, mm -hmm. uh, snowstorms, they have to clear out certain areas during either extensive snow melt or rainstorms. And then, um, you know, one person had specifically said that, you know, they parked their cars on the south facing uh, section and there's actual tile or a slate that's falling down. So um, uh, I was, before I reached out to them, I kind of wanted to get an idea in my head what type of work this would be. You know, it's 200 and some odd thousand dollars much like the paint job, I mean, are we just keep spending and spending and spending during a difficult time? Um, having looked at all those and having got a lot of questions answered, um, you know, I got to sit before you tonight and, you know, approve something like this. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we are in a budget situation as I've talked about extensively over the last couple of weeks. Um, but for the uh, continued, you know, health of not only the building, but those who are working inside of it, I think that we need to uh, um, get this project going right now as soon as possible before any more damage is done. And you know, just like any homeowner has, once that first drip starts to go, soon enough you're racking up the bills. And um, you know, something like this should be done, um, uh, you know, expeditiously. So, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, <clears throat> Sally, I, I know we don't normally do school roofs until the summer when the kids aren't around. Mm -hmm. This building is next to a school. Yes. Uh, will we be taking precautions to block the kids off from being able to get near the building while this work's going on? Very much so. The building will be scaffolding around the building. There will also be a covered walkway to allow people to park their cars and then walk into the building safely. Um, and so we've been working with Fred Bushy and his group about how they're going to cordon <coughs> off that area. Um, we are also creating a staging area very close to the building. Uh, if you're familiar with the building at all in the parking lot, there is a row of parking spaces right up to the sidewalk. We would, our plan is to take all of those spaces to relocate temporarily excuse me, the ADA spaces, the handicapped parking spaces, which will allow us to utilize that area um, for lay down area so that um, workers will not have to carry materials very far and we can really keep the construction site uh, as small and as concise as necessary and as safe as possible. How long a project is this from start to finish? anticipated we could be looking at it's, it's a well over four week project it's easier than a standish house because it's just stripped yes. replace right. the wood and move on to to take the roof off is really not a difficult process um, a because most of it is coming off anyway but it just to strip a roof is not a very difficult process and then it's really seeing what's underneath it as as um, councilmember Rell mentioned there has been water infiltration and we do have a contingency in there to do some repairs so that's when we really can can get to it and yep. see it we also do if you choose to go with slate um, find the the we do have sources for the slate. It's the deliver, what's the deliverable time for that product um, to be able to get here. So that's why I don't have a very, I don't have an actual specific date. We know it would take more than four weeks, but in the process of it being ordered, they would go about doing the removal and repair um, so that when the product arrives on site, it would be ready for it to be installed. I had another question sure. <clears throat> on the warranty, the the natural slate versus this product. What is there? Must be a difference in warranty. There are extensive warranties. I mean, the the 
Da Vinci product um, now has extended to the lifetime. They call it a lifetime. Um, and the same thing with, with the different slate. We would get those warranties, obviously, and review them to make sure that we are getting the longest and most comprehensive warranty available. What's a, a lifetime, 50 years? 50 years plus. 50 yes. years plus. Okay. 40 in your case. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, you two, I'm just saying, going to Cheeks and having chicken and the fried chicken. And yeah. I got to take 10 years off of that. All I know it will be the warranty after I won't be here for it. So. Okay. Thank you. We'll leave a note. Yeah. <laughs> just quick clarification, and I apologize. Um, so the Da Vinci is what's going to be used on a majority of the roof, but there is a flat section that we're doing natural slate with? No, the, the, um, the roof was bid out using the Da Vinci slate product everywhere. Okay. Um, and so the alternate is to use natural slate instead of the Da Vinci slate. The built up roof is a very small part of the roof that you don't even see. It's really up top and you can't see it from when you're on the ground or even when you're on the first floor. You really have to be up on the roof and inside to see it. It's just that, again, it's part of the whole envelope. And when you're working on the envelope, do it all, shore it up and make sure that you have, you have truly created that seal um, because that roof is not as old as the slate roof but still when you start that project do the whole thing you get a sealed envelope and your warranties to make sure that you are watertight so we're doing two products no i'm no. just thoroughly confused i'm sorry we're recommending you ditch the da vinci right and, and do all slate do yes all slate, yes and the difference on that is eighteen thousand three hundred dollars we thought when we bid it that the delta between the two would be much more significant. Yeah. But since the overall price came in low and the difference between the natural slate and the Da Vinci is not slight, but not as extreme as we thought it would be, right, right. we are recommending using the natural tile as the primary product. Thank you. I didn't get that at all. No. <laughs> it's sorry, just one more question. In Looking a little bit further, if you have the uh, bids in front of you. Yes. <laughs> just going from the first uh, Silk Town to Vendor 2, Capewell, for the, where was it? Uh, under grand total, the alternate price items. Number one, install new slate tiles to match. Here's the 1834 Silk Town. But if we just jump over one, it goes from 18.3 to 283,000. 200. I mean, do we know why there's a delta of t over 250,000 on that? If you look at that one, and then you look at the ones on the rest of the line, um, we were only, even though there were representatives there from the companies when we opened up the bids, we didn't know if maybe they had put a decimal place decimal point in the wrong place mm -hmm. or they had we had no explanation as to it but if you look in total the 18 was really kind of in the range of the 23 36 39 17 of the other ones right. so we just felt that there must have been some type of a mathematical mistake on the part of capeway when they submitted their bid okay and alden bailey vendor three had it included in the 243 810 that was their choice to do. And they, okay. And there's no way of, I mean, it, it really doesn't matter, but it, like you said, it could just be a typo in 28,320 or something like that. But Check yeah. your work before you put it in. Or it could be $42,000, just a delta between the two. The two. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just saw that and kind of It's startling. <laughs> yep. Because if, I mean, having sat through the HDC hearings and, and talking to some folks, yeah, originally we were thinking about a slate roof would be about a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000 to go with a natural slate. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't be out of the realm originally, but looking at the 18.3, I just hope that it comes with a warranty as Mike had mm -hmm. stated earlier. Thank you.
Okay. Um, we have a motion to second with the contingency as expressed by Jeff. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thanks. And just on the secondary, we will be getting out the LEAF um, schedule. It is um, tentatively scheduled to begin on or about Monday, October 30th. Ooh. which is in line with our with when we usually begin um, so we will be posting that on the website and throughout town so that people will know uh, <laughs> that when when we have the two pickups in their areas thanks Sally uh, the minutes of uh, September 18th please make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of September 18 2017 second any changes deletions Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Meeting of September 20th? Make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of September 20th, 2017. Second. Motion is second. Any changes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Should be one abstention, right? The special meeting? Who We've got there? another special no. meeting. Oh, that. the second special yeah. meeting. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve the special meeting of September 28th, 2017. Thank you. Second. Motion is second. Uh, any changes on that one? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And abstention? Abstain. Thank you. Okay. Public comment? Tom? <coughs> Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. Uh, thanks, Paul, for your explanation on some of the questions that I posed. Uh, I know it's not supposed to be a back and forth, but I appreciate you taking a little latitude there. Uh, just a, one quick comment on the Stillman roof. Uh, the town's paying for the repairs of the roof, but there's significant damage in, to the interior, the plaster, the painting. I don't know if some woodwork's damaged or whatever, but uh, is that the responsibility of the Board of Ed to correct? I, when my kids went to school in Wethersfield quite a while back, there was some schools that had roof leaks and the leaks got repaired, but the, you always had the water stains uh, on the ceilings and so forth. So um, I didn't see anything in the bid spec where they were gonna do any interior work, so I'm just, Curious, uh, you know, do we just fix the roof and pay for it? And then the Board of Ed kind of says, look at the <coughs> condition of the buildings that we're in. And we have to, again, renovate the Board of Ed building. Thank you. I was going to say, we'll ask Fred Bushy, Tom, about that. I would Thank think you. that he knows about it. Good evening again, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, Tom brought up a good issue on that regarding the interior repairs over to Stillman as to who will be responsible. Normally the town gets hammered for things like that. Uh, what I was gonna talk about last time was, <clears throat> there was an article in the paper regarding advocates plead for program funds. As we know, with the with the way the budget's going up in the state capitol uh, and all the proposed cuts that were taking place as of October 1st. Uh, there's been groups and groups of people going up there complaining and pleading for funds. And, uh, you know, we, we taxpayers just keep paying and paying and paying and everybody wants funds. Uh, one of them in particular that I was reading about was uh, paying for job training programs for young adults with intellectual disability. Uh, it makes economic sense, uh, said parents and advocates who call on Malloy to ratify the funding, because evidently he cut the funding. The cost is $630,000 a month. And you know, this is for those students who leave our transitional academy, they then go somewhere else. You know, we started with these youngsters in kindergarten. We 
get them to tw 18, 19 years old when they're supposed to graduate. They don't graduate until they're 21 out of the transitional academy. Then they go to some other place within the state of Connecticut for who knows how long, how many decades. And you know, our transitional, first of all, what in the world do they learn in our normal school? And there's a lot of them. And then they go to the traditional school, the traditional academy to learn how to make a bed. Are you really going to pick take on, care of really things. Pick on people with disabilities? I, this is outrageous. This, everybody's complaining for money, Mr. Barry. It's, it's everybody's complaining for money. But the fact remains, no, you got me all wrong, Mr. Barry. No, I don't think I do after tonight's comments. We put them through school from kindergarten to 12th grade, and they're still in 12th grade when they're 21 years old. And then where do they go? They go to this state program. You know, where does the taxpayer come to the end of paying, Mr. Barry? You have so much to say. Where does the taxpayer's abil um, responsibility come to an end and the parents need to pick it up? No wonder the state is in such shape. We have people like you sitting up here who make decisions that continue to cost us. They're called eternal life. Eternal, eternal life programs, Mr. Barry, and the people like you are responsible for them the way you're talking. As a taxpayer, it's got to come to an end. And the only way it's coming to an end now is through this uh, executive order. And maybe the longer it goes, the better off we'll be. But somehow the parents need to step up and take care of their own. Don't expect the community to continue and continue and continue. Heck, we just saw that with the state of, with the, the city of Hartford, with, with, with Mayor Bronin coming here begging for us to help him. Help him in something that they self-inflicted on themselves for years and years of spending without any concern where the money's going to come from, Mr. Barry. And, and those are part of the state of Connecticut's problems as well. Things were voted for, approved, and nobody knew where the money's going to come from. Let everybody else pay. That's how you are. You think I'm wrong in coming up here complaining about why are we continuing and continuing and continuing to spend? You don't have the solution. Your solution is tax the people of the state of Connecticut to get those services. That's your solution, and that's no solution. Figure out how to, how to put it to an end. That's what you should be finding out. It's like all these eternal life programs we have in this town. You don't, you don't work to try to figure out how we can slow it down and then bring it to a stop. No, your attitude is continue to vote for more taxes. Forget figuring out how to take care of it. So don't come at me. You folks are voting for eternal life programs without going after them. Look at your field over here at Catone Field. 14 years of run. And how much money did the school have, uh, did the Catone Field have to put forward for $1.2 million for new turf? They had zip because of the attitude that you have. Tax the people. Tax the people. Who cares? Tax them twice for it. That's what you're doing. Did you come up with a plan, Mr. Barry, before you voted on putting that new turf down on the field to find out how you could get a plan to get money out of every year that that turf is being used? So when the turf needs to be replaced, the money is there. You didn't do a damn thing. All you did was vote for more higher taxes by going out remortgaging that field. And that's what you did. That's what all of you have done. You didn't fix the problem. Kick the can down the street. 
and keep taxing everybody. Thank you very much. Anybody else? See Good night. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Aye. 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 Thank you.